the Seahawks responded to their worst loss in a long time by landing a late knockout blow in an all-out brawl with the Washington Commanders. The win moves Seattle to 6-3 and three and keeps them tied for first place in the NFC West. Joining us to take a deeper look at what transpired and what lies ahead is former NFL wide receiver Michael Bumpus. Let's light him up. I'm Jackson Bevins, and this is Cigar Thoughts. Welcome back to the Cigar Lounge. I am Jackson Bevins, and along with my jacked producer, Mike Barwin, this is the Cigar Thoughts Podcast. Mike, how are we doing today? That's pumped and jacked to you, bub. Yes, sir. (laughs) I'm doing well, man. I'm doing well. Hell of a hell of a weekend of football. They had us in the first half, I'm not going to lie, but <laughs> yeah, it, things, things turned around for the better. How are you? Uh, I'm feeling great, bro. Yesterday's game was really fun, and even though it was close the whole way through, I honestly never felt overly concerned. Sure. If anything, I was annoyed that they just kept letting the commanders hang around, but overall, I thought they played pretty well. It kind of reminded me of the Panthers game in that way. Bunch of field goals early before finally breaking through for some touchdowns in the second half. Oh, 100%. I literally texted my buddy Tony in the middle of the game saying, I'm praying that this is just the Panthers game where it's all field goals the first half and they somehow end up at 37 points. (laughs) That's great. You know, it's so funny when we text each other during the games, it's like, the mind meld that you and I have. Yes. It's like, we'll text each other observations. Like, I was just saying that <laughs> yes. to somebody else. Yep, yep. It, honestly, the most frustrating part about the beginning of that game was just how directly it was feeding into the narratives propagating throughout the discourse right now. Like, I as know. it pertains to Gino and DK and all, like, the offense at large, all that. But they they salvaged something by the end there. And I don't know how Gino ended up at a career high in passing yards by the end of that game, but he did, and the Seahawks won. I mean, they always play the commanders close. So, I mean, you and I talked about this months and months and months ago that for whatever reason, you that game it. was going to be disgusting and a total I think sweat. it was our season preview yes. episode with Danny O'Neill, and right. we were like, what's, right. what's the one game you're most worried about? Mm-hmm. And I had said the second Rams game, and you said the commanders we game. We still got time for that, baby. Let's check in a week from now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, God. God, I hope not. I hope I'm really wrong yeah. about that one, man. You know, I think we saw what we needed to see in the second half of that game to like at least assuage some of the fears, if not completely put them to rest. And I'm excited to talk more about it with today's guest. But real quick, if you're listening or watching us right now, it's hopefully because you like the show. And if you like the show, there are a few ways you can support it. If you're on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, take a couple of seconds to leave us a five-star rating. And if you're feeling super supportive, a quick review as well. In fact, you can do that right now. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you'll find full video episodes, entertaining clips, and the audio reads of every Cigar Thoughts article after each game this season. We're also thrilled to announce an awesome new partnership with Westland Distillery in Seattle. If you're watching on YouTube, I'm enjoying a glass of their flagship American Single Malt, which you can see right here, which is probably my favorite local whiskey. Needless to say, I'm stoked to be working with them, and one of the reasons I love their whiskey so much is that they're excellent pairings with a good cigar. And speaking of, we do have our own special release of cigars that you can purchase at a terrific price as a listener of the show. In fact, I'm smoking one of them right now. As many of you know, we partnered with one of the most prestigious cigar manufacturers in the world to release these official Cigar Thought cigars, which you can order directly from CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Just follow the link to get these easy-to-smoke stogies rolled with 13-year-aged premium Dominican tobacco leaf or hit us up on Twitter or Instagram, and we'll send you the details directly. As we've mentioned before, a box of 10 stogies with this particular blend would normally go for between $300 or $400, but our partnership allows you to get your own bundle of 10 for just $169, which is less than half of MSRP. And the cigars, they come with a Bevita humidification pack and a Mylar storage bag to make sure they stay fresh, whether you have a humidor or not. Listen, Mike, the Seahawks are back. And by back, (laughs) I mean they had us sweating out another tight win that was probably closer than it should have been. Still, we saw Seattle play complimentary football for 60 minutes. And by that, I mean the defense was fantastic while the offense worked out their kinks, 
and the offense returned the favor late when the defense ran out of gas. The win keeps the Seahawks in first place in the NFC West, and although it may not feel like it, they've won twice as many games as they've lost this year. At 6-3, and three, there are still a lot of questions to answer as they hit the Fury Road portion of their schedule, which is why we're so amped to have today's guest with us to help answer them. He set the career record for receptions at Washington State University before being signed by the Seattle Seahawks in 2008. Now, he's an analyst for the Pac-12 Network and co-host of the entertaining Bump and Stacy show on Seattle Sports 710. He is Michael Bumpus. Bump, thanks for joining us. What up, what up? Thanks for having me, man. Another week, um, another stressful game, but... uh... (laughs) That's the NFL for you. Yeah, man. Yeah, well, it's always a blast having you in here with us. And and let's go ahead and dive into this game yesterday. You know, I think it's too early for true must-win games, but after getting obliterated in Baltimore last week, the difference between a win and a loss felt huge for this one, didn't it? Yeah, man. If you if the Hawks lost this one, <clears throat> we're talking five and three. We're talking second in the NFC West. Um, you had an opportunity to kind of keep pace with the Niners. But really just for respect. They need mm-hmm. to come out here and just look like a good football team. I mean, you put up three points, 151 yards of total offense, while the Ravens put up 500. It was like, all right, you could you could lose this game and have some respect, but uh, you got to take care of these type of teams. And I want to say that people thought, you know, the commanders, it was going to be just be a breeze. Man, Howell was second in the NFL and passing for a reason. Now yep. number one when it comes to yards. Yep. Uh, the enemy's over there. They have some good receivers. Um, I was nervous coming into this one, though. This it, Not a must win, but I must see this team look like a solid ball club. Yeah, and you know, lately we've been starting this show off talking about the defense, and we'll definitely get to them in a bit, but I want to hear more about your impressions of the offense yesterday because we saw them get three field goals in the first half, but they were so close to so much more. I mean, twice they had fourth and one turn into fourth and six due to pre-snap penalties, and then they gave up their final chance at scoring in the second quarter. Gino took the intentional grounding on the last play. But after that, they did start to click. And Gino finished with over 200 yards passing and two touchdowns in the second half alone, including both of the crucial scoring drives in the final eight minutes. I mean, it's no secret that the offense has struggled lately, but I think a lot of that has to do with A, the extreme defensive talent they faced, and B, Mm -hmm. the injuries to the offensive line. Even so, Smith has looked more jittery than he did last season, and the connection with his receivers has been off. So when you step back and look at everything we've seen from Geno this year, was his true ability closer to what we saw in the first half of yesterday's game or what we saw in the second half? I think um, yesterday is who Geno is to a T. Mm. He's a guy that is going to have some rough patches in a game, more often than not. Uh, I think last year he overachieved. You make the Pro Bowl. You throw 30 touchdowns. It's all love, right? But. Like most quarterbacks who throw out a game, there's going to be times where he struggles. And it's not just him, man. You mentioned the offensive line Mm -hmm. having their struggles. And teams have kind of figured out if you just overwhelm this offensive line, they are going to give up a couple plays. And I think we saw that. And then you look at the receivers as well. Uh, Last week, the Rams played a lot of man coverage. And they forced receivers to be true technicians. And I think the Hawks are overwhelmed a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the receivers, the JSNs, the Lockets, the the DKs, um, they're so used to seeing zone that uh, when you do get this man, this man defense, you're forced to get into your bag. And then you combine it with Geno not wanting to make the mistake. So he's holding on to the football. So the line's giving up pressure. Receivers aren't at their best at the time. And then Geno's holding on to the football. Then you throw in the play calling. It's just a recipe for disaster. So I think what we saw yesterday is who Geno is. There's going to be a moment in the game where he looks like a second-round quarterback. And can we remind people that, that this guy was not like a top-10 draft pick people right. expect him to perform that way when really that's not who, who he's been or who he was um so no i think uh i think gino's a guy that if given an opportunity he can win a ball game for you but there's going to be a moment during that game where you're going to have to help him out and, and give him another opportunity or erase some uh some struggles that are being had yeah i think that's a really salient point for this discussion and i think that we got to keep in mind that's true of almost every quarterback. Right. Like the number of quarterbacks you say, okay, you see him struggling in a game and I'm just not worried about them at all. It's like five, maybe yeah. six, maybe, you know, I mean, like you can, even, you don't even have to go far that far down the list. You see Trevor Lawrence struggling in a game. This is the golden boy. I'm not even like, Oh, he's going to be okay. Like, I don't know. 
<laughs> you know, like that is true. Eighty percent of the starting quarterbacks, if not more, in this league, and yeah, Geno's in that. But I think he is closer to the top of that group than he is to the bottom. Yeah, for sure. I was uh, I was on a show with Stacy today, and I named off maybe eight, nine quarterbacks. Where I'm like, Geno's better than all these guys. Mm-hmm. Now, there's only like you mentioned, three to five elite of the elite, right? Right. The Pat Mahomes, the Josh Allen's, the the, the Joe Burrow, who took an L to a rookie quarterback yes, he this did. past weekend. It lets you know how how tough it is. Um, there's only a few of those guys. You know, there's only a few of the guys that gave me the same feeling Michael Jordan used to give me at the free throw line. When I was a kid growing up and Jordan was at the free throw line, I'm like, there's no way he's going to miss. I promise you, I don't remember Jordan missing the free throw. <laughs> right, right? Totally. Guaranteed he missed him, but I don't remember him. That's just mm-hmm. the feeling that he gives you. There's only been three quarterbacks in my lifetime to where I'm like, this dude's going to pull off the win. And as of late, it's Pat Mahomes, Tom Brady, and then growing up in Cali, I used to watch Steve Young and think he was the greatest. Of and he's going to pull it off. Yeah. So um, th- that's the thing that that uh, that, that kind of kills me with Seahawks fans is that um, they have this arrogance to them sometimes mm. as if their quarterback <laughs> is supposed to be perfect while everyone else quarterbacks has those struggles. Right. Right, man. It's just – and the thing is, is like – and look, I'm not saying that as fans we shouldn't be holding our team, especially when they're – you know, looking like potential contenders, they right. should be held to a high standard. They they should be, but like, let's not rob ourselves of joy. You know, if you're <laughs> rooting for a good team, there's maybe 10, maybe on a really good season, 12 days right. where you're like, we want a game 12 out of 365. If you can't enjoy those 12 days, man, like, what are you even doing? You know, <laughs> like wins, <laughs> wins are hard in the NFL. And Yeah, the Commanders, when you think about them, you're like, oh, this is not a team that's a real threat to, you know, win a bunch of playoff games or anything like that. But, man, they gave the Philadelphia Eagles, who have the best record in the NFL, everything they could handle. Took them down just as tough as they took Seattle in this game twice, both of those games. So, I mean, it's not like this is a pushover. And if you need Seattle to win by three scores in order to be happy or you need their wins to all be against seven and two teams – it's going to have a hard time enjoying football, man. <laughs> yeah, man. You got to you gotta take your wins. I, I mean, you got to be honest, too, right? You of look course. at, okay, maybe Geno held the ball here a couple times, or maybe the play calling isn't what, what you would have done. But I always remind people, I go, these guys are making decisions based off of preparation mm-hmm. and, like, trying to limit mistakes. It's not mm-hmm. like they're just going out there and Shane is saying, oh, you know, let's try this play and see if it works. Or, or Gino is, is just deciding to hold on to the football. He's holding on to the football because, one, he doesn't like what he sees or he's getting pressure. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, enjoy the wins. Six and three. I mean, there are a lot of teams out right now who are tanking. Like, imagine The being an Bills Arizona. are five and four. Exactly. Bills five and four. I mean, imagine I'm watching Zach Wilson trick the game off last night. Imagine <laughs> if that was your situation. Like oh, yeah. uh, I, but yeah, I guess it's a privilege, too, right? Because you've had so much success. Yeah, that people are just used to it and they yeah. want to see excellence. And I get that, but I'm with you 100%, man. Enjoy those W's, man. You know, you mentioned the receivers earlier, and I'm, I'm glad you did. Obviously, you have unique insight into that position. And, you know, one of the frustrations, I think, with this offense is we're used to seeing big numbers from Tyler Lockett and big numbers from DK Metcalf. And if not in the same game, at least they're alternating. And neither of them really popped off yet this year. But we did finally see DK Metcalf get going. And I think for me, the most like, and, and same for, for Tyler Lockett. I want to get your thoughts on, on each of these guys, but you know, when it was 1919, Geno Smith on that next drive, looked Tyler Lockett's way four times in the same drive mm-hmm. and connected on all four of those passes, including the touchdown after Washington came down and tied it again, he went to DK twice for 44 yards to me. It was like, okay, it's winning time. We need to send out our champions, give the ball to your best player, go win this game. And that's what they did. And for me, it was really encouraging to be reminded that these two guys are still capable of coming through with really big plays, especially when the team really needs it. Yeah, it's almost like they play better in those moments, too. Mm -hmm. Gino steps his game up when his back is against the wall. And uh, people called me crazy last week because I was like, look, I'm not saying start Drew um, or uh, give him more reps. But create something in practice to where Drew is competing with Gino in some type of way because mm. I feel like Gino's at his best when he's, he has that competition. But then when it comes to the receivers, 
Um, as much as people don't want to give Shane Waldron some love when it comes to uh, some play calling decisions, you got to give him love. He knew that the commanders are going to come out and they were going to man him up in this situation. Mm -hmm. So what does he do? He isolates uh, DK on the backside. Simple slant. Boom, just get him the football right now. Uh, so sometimes that's what it comes down to. Create your one-on-ones and let your guys go. And then you talk about the uh, the touchdown to go up uh, with Tyler Lockett. That right there is just, I'm going to put it in a place where only my guy can get it. And when you are in the red zone like that, I expect Tyler Lockett to work the back of the end zone. That's where he does his work. Mm -hmm. You put him at the number two, number three receiver spot. He works back corner. This time they put him at the number one spot, right? He fakes the fade, breaks it down, and Gino just makes a hell of a throw. It comes down to one-on-one -on -one just making plays at that point. The scheme is out the window. You pick your best plays. The defense got to respond. And those guys have done it. And I'm happy because I thought DK has struggled the last couple of weeks. And I think he's banged up. I think his ribs are still hurting him. Yeah. Uh, you watch him. It looks like it's it's hurting a little bit out there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're and, and they're pacing him too. You know, anytime he's he's going up for a contested catch or has to dive or or gets hit, he's taking the next play off. And look, yeah. we we know D, this is this is not load management for DK. Like if he's taking himself out of the game, he's hurting, right? Yeah. But you know what was so cool about that touchdown to lock it, and I like so much, and and I realized right after it happened, like oh man, we've been missing this, and I think a lot of it has to do with how much they've struggled at the right tackle position since Abe Lucas got hurt. But that was a moving pocket. They they designed Gino to move right. That was mm -hmm. set like everything was set up for that throw. And all 11 players were moving in concert to make that throw happen. And it's just like, man, so many times this team over the last six weeks, I mean, really since the Panthers game, they get into the red zone and it's like, they just, I don't know if it's lack of creativity, lack of protection, whatever. They haven't been able to get Geno moving and in rhythm when they get close to the end zone. So it was super encouraging to see that. That's when Geno's at his best, honestly, I think, is when he is moving mm -hmm. or when he's under center and he's using a play action. Um, he's an athlete. I mean, he's not a Lamar Jackson or even a Josh Allen type of quarterback when it comes to that type of athleticism, but he likes to move, man. Mm -hmm. So, no, I, I like the play call. My buddy Nigel Burton over there, he UW guy, he uh, works at the Pac-12 Network. He hates rollouts in the red zone, and I'm trying to tell him, I go, look, man, what that does, it, it just creates lanes because if not, you're dropping back, everything's stationary, the, the concepts are most likely mirrored, and those safeties don't have to move. Once you start moving, guys, those lanes start opening up, and then you can kind of freestyle as a receiver, too, especially if you're on the back end. JSN was on the back end. DK was on the back end. Yep. Um, I believe Noah Fant was in the slot. Uh, he got locked up, so that wasn't an option. But if that play didn't work out there, you still had JSN working the back end. So, no, I, I like the movement. It allows you to use your athleticism as a quarterback and as a receiver, too. It's not precise route running. It's, it's an influential route running. Yeah, it's like there's a little bit more margin for error there. Yeah. Right. Like the ball doesn't have to come out at exactly 2.12 seconds and your head has to be exactly flipped around at the top of your fourth step. Right. Like it's it's a chance to get into your route, feel the defense, find a soft spot, which I still think is the strongest part of Lockett's game. And, uh, you know, someone who's as good at throwing in rhythm as Smith is, is like, OK, game on the line. Let's play to the strengths of our best players. And that's what they did. And that was really, really cool to see. And then like you just take the receiving core as a whole, like their numbers, like we said, have been down. I'm not sure. I think Lockett has 100 yard game, but that's the only one that yeah. Seattle has uh, from a receiving standpoint all season. But DK seven for 98 on 12 targets Lockett eight for 92 on 10 targets, Jackson Smith and Jigba four for 53 on five targets. All told those three receivers had 20 catches for 244 yards. Like that to me, that's the blueprint. Yeah, and um, and Jay Singh got the party started, right? First, third down, third and six. You mm -hmm. run him a shallow, you get him the football, and he gets going. Also, something I saw, every receiver had a screen thrown their way. Everyone oh, good observation. Singh got one. DK got a smoke screen. He picked up a first down on third and one. Lockett had a screen. I think he was one yard short. But I like trying to get these guys a football. Even Uncle Will Disley got a screen. Tight end screen for <laughs> yeah. 12, 13 yards. Uncle Will jogging down the middle of the field um, <laughs> so they're they're finding ways to get these dudes the football man it's uh it's fun to watch especially jsn man you, you see the potential in that dude oh and the fact that he had three of his catches on the opening drive of the game i was like okay yeah. this is not just like 
all right, we've got this third talented receiver is like, Hey, we can make this dude a focal point of, of the ball game. And, you know, it's, it's like a consistency. It's, it's, it's one of like the hard laden facts of the modern NFL is that good rookie wide receivers, like the ones who end up going on to be really successful. The second half of their rookie year is where you see it. And man, you made the transition from college to the league. Like just give me 60 seconds on how difficult it is to go from running a college, you know, offense as a wide receiver and against college DBs to learning how to operate at the NFL level. Yeah, man, it's um you're learning a new playbook, right? I mm-hmm. mean, routes are routes, concepts are concepts. You're gonna hear or see similar concepts, but it's learning the language feeling the speed of the game. And obviously, Jay Sim was a far better receiver than I could even think of, um, you know, at, compare myself to him. And you see that he has to struggle or he struggles a little bit. It's all yeah. part of it, man. Especially when you're not a, a physically dominating type of receiver. You're not just a DK, but you're going to be able to throw the football up three or four times a game. And just because he's big, he's going to come down with it. Uh, right. Working out of the slot, which is primarily what Jay Sim does, you got to feel it. I remember my first time working a slot and there's a linebacker running with me i'm like man only linebackers i ever ran with me in college went to sc and auburn and those guys are in the nfl like yeah. to feel that speed is something different and just to learn your role i mean we're talking about the same guy who had 300 yards in the rose bowl you know and <laughs> right in all these targets and now you got to be patient yeah you got to work your way back in and you break your wrist or bone in your wrist and you're set back that way so um it's it's understanding who you are because who you were in college doesn't necessarily mean that's who the team needs you to be when you get to the that's NFL. Good point. And clearly, they need him to be a number three, not a number one. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great point, man. Let's talk about this run game because that ain't been working either <laughs> since nah. the first month of the season. And it wasn't great yesterday, but it was better. You know, obviously, Ken Walker, he had the 64-yard touchdown catch, and it was just, ah, uh, it was so refreshing to see Walker in the open field because we haven't really seen that. Like he's had a couple of 20, 30 yard runs, but he's never really gotten loose like that. And once he broke that first tackle about 20 yards downfield, it was like, Oh yeah. (laughs) I remember when he used to do that, like every other week last season and he just obliterates the pursuit angles. And, and that was great. But other than that, you know, he had 19 carries for 63 yards. He was still getting hit at or behind the line of scrimmage, uh, you know, a lot more. Charbonnet, not nearly as many opportunities, but more effective with them. He had six carries for 44. Now, context matters. A lot of that was in hurry up. You know, he had a couple of big runs on draw plays against light boxes, all of that. But still, he's coming on strong. We've been seeing basically an even snap split between those two over the last three weeks. Walker's been dealing with some injuries and, and whatnot. But what do you project from this backfield moving forward? Yeah, I think the the potential is great. I think they're trying to figure out their run game. I think um, with the offensive line that they've had, all the shuffling going on or whatnot, it's hard to build that chemistry. Uh, but I think they might have tapped into something yesterday. I was mm-hmm. talking to Stacy about this. Uh, the Hawks are primarily a zone type of team. So all that means is you're going to double the one tag of the three tag, and you'll climb up to the linebackers, and your running back is going to make you right. Yesterday I saw them run more gap stuff, so traps and powers. Um, or whatnot. And the reason why I like that with this group, because it tells the running back where to go right now. Instead of him mm. pressing a gap, trying to fill it around and bounce around a little bit, which Ken Walker is good at. I don't think you get away from it. But running those gap schemes where you're pulling your guard and, and you're you're doubling the one tag, it gets the running backs downhill right now. And I yeah. think Zach Charbonnet showed that he can excel at that. Like all those big plays that Charbonnet had, there was a power and there was a trap. And his timing and his rhythm is perfect for it. I don't think you get away from the zone. I think Ken Walker can be good with the zone. But I think that at your guard position, you're not as um, as strong at your guard and center position as you've been in the past. It's physically strong. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to get the push or haven't been getting the push. So um, I think uh, I think they're going to watch this film and say, all right, more trap, more power. And then you can RPO off of that. You get the you get the trap and the power going. You show the defense guards and tackles pulling. Uh, now you're RPOing off of that, and a guy like JSN can slip on the backside um, uh, of a of a run play, and make a play. Yeah, you know, I and and I feel like in that regard, having Anthony Bradford back is going to be huge. Like, yeah, you know, I, his his weaknesses, if he has any, are are in pass protection. But man, 
I mean, I the beginning of that that Bengals game, he was just obliterate. I mean, he was just knocking dudes off their spot moving forward, yeah. and they just haven't had any push since then when it comes to that. And so, getting him back, getting Abraham Lucas back, I think is going to make all the difference in the world for this offense. We're going to see a more comfortable and confident Geno Smith in the pocket. We're going to see more moving pockets, more rhythm throws. We're going to see a more effective run game, which in turn will help with the play action that Geno is so much better at than he is on non-play action. So, I mean, I feel like they're just two bodies up front away from really being able to go toe to toe with some of the best teams in the NFC that they're going to have to face coming up. Yeah, man. And Abe Lucas brings just like a nastiness to that line too. Yeah, he does. Like if you, if you ever get a chance to meet this dude, nice guy, Mm -hmm. um, local kid, obviously went to Wazoo from Everett. But um, he's got this presence about him that uh, I feel like every offensive line needs. For a while, it was Dwayne Brown. You know, he was the the attitude on that offensive right. line, and and Abe just just brings that. So not only schematically does it help you, but for your identity, you know, it, it's it's different when you roll up to the party with the homies. You got three of the big ones with you, you know, right. rather than you, you rolling up <laughs> yeah. to the party with, with the little squad. <laughs> it just brings a different. <laughs> Your attitude. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I hear that. You know, speaking of the big guys, though, the one guy that we haven't talked a lot about this year, and we talked a lot about him last year, is Charles Cross. And, yeah. you know, he got hurt early, and, you know, he's kind of had to be the guy on the offensive line, whereas he was one of the guys last year. And I think expectations were lower because he was a rookie, and it was like, oh, pleasant surprise. But now it's like, okay, you're good. You know, you're kind of same thing with Gino. It's like, okay. You showed us you can be good now. You got to be good. Yeah. What have you seen from Cross so far this year? Um, I've seen some ups and downs, man. It's, it's He's a sophomore, second year in the league. You yeah. know, it's um, your first year you have – he had high expectations, obviously, because of where he was drafted, but low expectations because he's a rookie. That's a good just way how it is. That. You don't really depend on rookies. You put them out there, and you take whatever you can uh, from them. But now, like you mentioned, there's expectations, you know, and he hasn't been completely healthy. He's had a full year. Uh, he's he knows the system, but expectations can do a couple of things, man. It can tighten you up a little bit or, you know, it can allow you to flourish. And I think we got a little bit of both from Charles Cross, man. And then just not being healthy. Mm-hmm. I mean, being in the trenches is, is tough, man. Yeah, I can't man. imagine. Like, on the outside, you get the bigger hits, uh, but inside, it's it's constant friction, constant pressure, right? You're, you're always battling somebody. So I, it, it, there is a mix of things going on with Charles Cross. Um, but as he gets healthy, um, I'm seeing him get better. He's getting beat uh, less and less. Yeah, yeah, that's really encouraging, man. And I want to switch over to this defense, too, because I thought they actually played really well for, like, three and a half quarters. You know, the early touchdown of Brian Robinson was a breakdown, but after that, check out the next eight drives from the Commanders. It went punt, field goal, punt, 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 fumble, punt. Then they scored touchdowns on their final two drives. Fortunately, they were bailed out by the offense, you know, I think it's safe to say this defense isn't as good as they look during that dominant stretch in October, but they're not mm-hmm. as bad as they looked in Baltimore last week, are they? Nah, they're nowhere near as bad, man. I, I'm telling you, Baltimore might be the second or third best team in the NFL. Yeah. And, yeah. and they were coached up, man. Um, but no, who is this defense really, right? They are a defense with a secondary that has the potential, I think, to be the best in the league. Yes. But e- but everything's connected, right? You're counting on Leonard Williams to show up. He gets his first sack. He's taking on double teams. Yeah, he was. You're counting on Boye Mafe to step up. He's seven Ooh. straight games with a sack, breaks a franchise record. And now you're still waiting on a couple more pieces, right? You're waiting to see what DT can do. Can he contribute a bit more? Um, you're waiting to see if uh, if Bobby and Jordan can stay healthy. So no, I think they took advantage of of their their situation with those games where they were being were being dominant. But just like teams figure out offenses, teams figure out defenses. Why do you think most of the big plays for the Commanders are out in the flats? They said, look, we're gonna make these edge rushers have to peel with the running backs. We're gonna make these linebackers have to cover the flat areas too, and we're just gonna deacon duck. And that's where Sam Howell is the best coming into this game. The commanders were second in the league when it comes to yards after catch because they just get the fuck the football out early and let these dudes run. So uh, I think that they saw something, uh, a weakness in this defense, and uh, and they exposed it a little bit. So uh, there's always something to work on. I think that's the next step. It's almost it's good that the commanders put this on film because just like we see it, uh, mm-hmm. these coaches are going to see it too and say, all right, how do we get our guys better at controlling the flats? 
Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting you mentioned that. First, first of all, I want to give flowers to Sam Howell because yeah. that guy went out there and did not give a fuck. And he hasn't yeah. his whole NFL career. Like, that dude, he's balling. And, like, I've always had a soft spot for quarterbacks with just, like, outrageous confidence. And that's how he plays. He reminds me of Baker Mayfield that way yeah. a lot. You know, maybe with a little bit more arm talent where he's just like, man, if he sees something, he's going to rip it. And he did. And what I thought was so impressive from the Seahawks defense yesterday is they shut down the wide receivers. I mean, if you take a look at this offense and say, who are the best players on the commander's offense? For me, it's Terry McLaurin and Jahan Dotson. They shut yeah. out Dotson. They held McLaurin. I think McLaurin had like three catches. And all told, you know, receivers only accounted for nine of the 29 completions in that game. And you're right. It's like it took Washington three quarters to realize, oh, okay, you know what? We can't win with those guys on the perimeter today. I thought Reek Woolen played his best game of the season. Yeah. Witherspoon and Trey Brown were great like they've been. But I, I thought the safeties were shaky. I thought they were actually really shaky. But mm -hmm. they they took advantage of Bobby Wagner and Jordan Brooks. They looked lost on those crossing routes and on the flare routes with those running backs. And shit, man, the running backs had 162 yards receiving this right. game. The running backs did. Yeah, it's, um, it's a game of matchups, man. And I think um, they looked at the matches. And McLaurin is a, is a great receiver. He'll go 4,000 yards this year, mm -hmm. uh, four seasons in a row. The only commander's receiver to ever do that. That's wild. Um, yeah, it is, right? It, Art Monk never I did that? that <laughs> no, nah, I, I heard that stat, and it, I had the same feeling I had when I heard that the Bears have never had a 4,000-yard <laughs> no, There's no way. Right. No way. Um but it is, it's matchups, and they saw the matchup and say, look, we're a bit younger. We're a bit faster. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we can line these guys up and go. Uh, it, but that's that's credit to Eric Bieniemy, and I think that he needs more love, too, because he's the one who's designing all of this. Yeah, They think they have their franchise quarterback in Sam Howell, and the big reason for that is Bieniemy understands this dude. How, the way Howell plays, he's going to be the minimum in the NFL sooner or later. A guy mm -hmm. who can run the football, so you mm -hmm. have to respect him. But a dude who understands who he is. He's he's a, he's more athletic than what people think, too. That's why Boye Mafe uh, came off of uh, Robinson on that big touchdown. Because yes. he was peeling with Robinson. But you see how get loose. He goes, man, if I don't get him, no one else is going to get him because he can go. So uh, I, I like how, man. I'm glad you're giving him flowers because um, after watching film on him all week, I'm telling all my boys, I go, y'all don't sleep on this dude. He's I know. up there at numbers for a reason. I know. Yeah, he's he's really exciting and you know, he hasn't he hasn't shrunk from any of the matchups that he's faced so far in the NFL. Right. So like, you know, there's reasons to be critical about this defense, but there's two sides to every coin, of course, right? Like they they got good quarterback play on the other side and in the running backs did a phenomenal job also, you know, yeah. and and to your point about Howell's mobility, you know, those two long completions to uh, Brian Robinson, you know, he had 63 yard touchdown and then a 48 yard catch later. That was because on both of those plays, both of those plays, they blitzed a defensive back from Sam Howell's right. And he's right hand quarterback. So, like, if you can get him moving left, that is typically to the defense's advantage. First time was Jamal Adams coming free. He slipped right. that and made the throw. Second time was Witherspoon tracking him down. He was able to stay alive long enough to make the throw. It's like, and then his touchdown pass to Gibson was insane. Like from the far hash, just throwing that big rainbow on a wheel route to the other side of the field to a running back, like pretty impressive yeah. stuff. But at the same time, it's not like he's the only quarterback in the NFL that's capable of doing that. And, you know, the Seahawks are going to have, you know, Stafford obviously has, assuming he, he starts next week, he's got all the arm talent in the world. He's not that mobile. But after that, you get Brock Purdy great at throwing on the run. You're going to get Dak Prescott, great at throwing on the run. You're going to get Jalen mm -hmm. Hurts, elite throwing on the run. Like, that's going to be tough. And so, do you have concerns about these linebackers in that situation? Because they've been really good this year. Jordan Brooks and Bobby Wagner have played really well overall. But the last two weeks, man, they've been getting beat by some really fast players. Yeah, the the thing that concerns me is, one, Bobby is getting up there in age, right? Of course. And he, He's taking damn near every snap. <laughs> and you got Jordan Brooks coming off a of knee surgery. That knee has to be sore. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be weeks where they look a little slower than they, they have the week before. And I think if there is, I wouldn't call it a weakness on the defense, uh, but if there is a position that I think you can attack right now, it has to be the linebackers because of their age and the injury that they're coming off of. I'm concerned regardless. I mean, you got to play the Niners twice. You got to play the Eagles 
and Dallas. Those dudes can be 100% healthy with no torn ACLs and be 27 years old. And I'm still going to be concerned just because of the deception that the Niners bring, yeah. the physicality that the Eagles bring, and then this the spontaneousness of the Cowboys. You don't know who you're going to get. Dak threw for 400 yards uh, last week, but then he'll throw for 203 interceptions the next week. You just don't right. know what you're going to get. Right. Uh, so, yeah, mobile quarterbacks should scare everybody, not not just the Seahawks, man. Yeah, you know, well, let's let's talk a little bit about that because, you know, six and three, like I said earlier, man, I think all of us would have taken that if you offered it to us before the season started. But, yeah. you know, and and so much has been made about this upcoming gauntlet that sees the Cowboys and the Eagles bookended by showdowns for the 49ers. Now, there is a chance that the Seahawks enter that stretch at seven and three, which would be amazing, right? Like, right. yes, taking that 10 times out of 10. But in order to do that, they are going to have to exact revenge on a Rams team that ruined the season opener by delivering that 30 to 13 loss in Seattle that I think took all of us by surprise. So oh, yeah. as they had, you know, since then, the two teams have gone in opposite directions. Seattle has won six, eight since then. Rams have lost six of eight. How confident are you in this team's ability to go down to LA and win on Sunday? I'm confident, but I'm also um, cautious. Yeah. Sean McVay, for some reason, knows how to coach against a P curl team. Bro. And uh, you, you, got, you got Puka over there who's still, what, top five receiver in the league yeah. when it comes to numbers. Uh, they didn't have that, Cup uh, last time. They didn't yeah. even have Cooper Cup last time. Didn't have Cup last time. We'll see who starts at the quarterback spot. I think Matthew Stafford should be good to go. But you can't even be confident if, extremely confident if Carson Wentz plays because we I've seen a guy named Wolford come over to uh, Lumen Field <laughs> and, and beat and beat the, uh, the Seahawks. It's all about matchups. I'm yeah. confident because... Um, this team has shown, especially last week, like, look, offense, you can move the football. Defense, you can hold it down if need be. But there's still personnel. There's still still matchups. They haven't seen anybody like our dude Aaron Donald um, right. since Aaron Donald, Donald, right? You haven't even got a chance to, to get some uh, Nick Bosa in Hargrave because he ain't played the Niners yet. So the best lineman you've seen did good against you guys, and you got to see him again. Uh, so I'm I'm always I'm always confident but cautious with with the Rams, man. They're just some teams that mm -hmm. just know how to coach against Pete Carroll, and uh, they're one of them. Even the Cardinals, every now and then, like right, you beat the Cardinals by ten points, but at one point during that game, in at the beginning of the season, yeah, you felt like they could win the game. You know, the <laughs> yeah. Cardinals and the Rams always scare me, no matter what their records are. No, it's wild, man. It's like, you know, I was thinking like, all right, as Seahawks fan. Who are the players um, most worried about? Like, just fuck, man. I I hope this dude doesn't obliterate us. And I don't have to go too far down the list before I'm like Sean McVay, because <laughs> yeah. yeah. it's like it doesn't matter, man. I mean, that offense is so predicated on these deep crossing routes, which is, I mean, look, it's it's the antidote for the type of defense Seattle wants to play. If you can hit deep crossers, and if you can make that throw 20 yards down the field, over the linebackers, under the safety, and inside of the corner, then Seattle has never, I mean, even LOB, that was how Phillip Rivers beat them, you know, is, is hit yeah. Tom Brady beat them, is hitting those little soft spots. And Stafford has shown time and time again that he can do it. So, for me, that's that's the biggest thing. I think that in order for Seattle to win this game, and it's, you know, I feel like everybody says this, but that doesn't make it any less true, even if it's a bit of a cliche, man. They got to run the football. Like, they have to. Like, I want to see Geno out there. I love that he set a career high, 367 passing yards. I'd love to see that every week. But, man, they're not going to run 74 plays against the Rams. They're going to run, like, 55. And so yeah. they're going to need to – have extended drives and get first downs and they got to hit some big plays in the run game and just make it physical. Like I'm trying to think I'm looking at the schedule right now. I'm like, all right, when's the last game this year where I felt like they played a physical game? I guess you can look at the New York giants, mm -hmm. but we know who the giants are. 11 sacks. He played a bit physical. Uh, you can look at the Bengals maybe, but, the last real physical game they played, they were on the receiving end of that, mm -hmm. and that was against the Baltimore Ravens. Mm -hmm. So I think during during the course of a season, you want your team to show you that they could win certain style of games, right? And I think you're right. I think with the L.A. Rams, they will control the clock. It's going to be a grinder. Show that you can play a physical game. So when you get to the Niners, the Cowboys, the Eagles, um, you're ready for whatever they throw at you. So um, I think um, I think – 
this has the potential to be another game that the Hawks win by two scores, but feels like it's a lot closer than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, this one feels like it's going to be like 20 to 17 late. Yeah. <laughs> and then Seattle maybe yeah. gets like a touchdown kind of to put it away, right. make it 27, 17. Uh-huh. It's kind of how I feel like exactly. this is going. At least I hope. <laughs> right. And I mean, <laughs> shit, man, maybe they go out there and they just put it on the Rams. That would be, ah, uh, that would feel so good. But it's kind of, nice. it's kind of hard to see it. And, and the thing that's interesting about playing the Rams is, they have so much top end talent. I still think a healthy Matt Stafford. I'm taking him over, like from an NFL standpoint. Yeah. I'm taking him over all, but maybe like six dudes in the NFL. Right. Cooper Cup, fully healthy, top five wide receiver in this league. Puka yeah. <laughs> might be a top 10, 15 wide receiver in this league. That dude's unguardable. And then you know, Kyron Williams obviously has has looked great. They got Aaron Donald, so they have all this top tier talent, like elite top tier talent. But for the first time, really, in the McVay era, they got no depth. They got no depth. And that's yeah. why I think it's really important to have these long drives. And like you said, to be really physical because as you wear down, they don't have the guys that they can rotate in. You know what I mean? Like yep. Seattle is going to play a team that's going to start a lot of guys who would be backups on a lot of N- other NFL teams. I think they got like 20 something rookies on this roster. Yeah, man. It's, um, the great the great thing about playing a physical type of game is when you have guys tapping their helmets because they need to breather. Yeah, right? yeah. And, and and you want dudes tapping their helmets. I need a breather. Uh, you, you put together a 10, 12 play, 75-yard drive, and you're grinding it out. Even sometimes those drives, even if you don't score or you only get three points, those drives are just as good as an explosive drive with four plays, 65 yards, and you score a touchdown mm-hmm. because it challenges the mental of a team. Right? There's nothing like you being able to run the football three or four yards a clip. The team knows it's coming, but they can do nothing to stop it. You start second guessing. Like There's so many mental battles that go on on a football field that I think a lot of people just aren't aware of. You know, That's why Jamal is the biggest talker there is because he wants to get in your head mentally. Right. You know, there's a reason why Witherspoon is a big talker because he wants to get in your head mentally. And now when you're talking and you're wearing a team down, man, offensively or defensively, uh, it, it makes you rely on your training. It gets guys tapping their helmets. And now you're dealing with a second year guy out of West Virginia that no one talks about. And uh, you got that mental edge on them. So, yeah. no, nah, man, I, I think that's what I want to see. I think that's like the last thing I need to see from this offense because you've had the big passing days. You've had the games where the tight ends are involved. You've had one day where the run game is on point. It's like, all right, now, can you just grind one out and and make it physical and not have Witherspoon, the smallest dude on the field, be the guy with the biggest hit, you know, because those LBs involved and those safeties. Yeah, man, and and I really appreciate that you mentioned the helmet tapping because I think that's real talk from someone who's been there because, look, I feel like I got to say this once a month. And and anyone who reads my stuff knows this. I'm pro analytics. There, Every NFL team should be getting as much information from all the metrics available to them as they can. Right. But is it safe to say that helmet tapping is one thing that can't be captured by the spreadsheets? <laughs> no, that's – uh. That's all human right there. Yeah. There's no data. That's that's all gas, emotion, mental. Like you get a dude to tap out. And then he goes over there. I saw I saw Ken Walker tap his helmet. Then he went to the sideline and he took a knee and started drinking water. And in my head, I go, Oh no, don't take the knee. Right. Don't take the knee. Stand yeah. up, man. Like, come on, man. Like, don't don't let them see you down like that because I've had it to where I've lined up against a guy and he's huffing and puffing and I'm looking at the, my coach on the sideline and be like, throw it this way. Mm-hmm. Like this, it, it, He's hurting and watching him hurt does something to me that gives me that extra energy. So, yeah. No, I like data too. I think data is important. But then there's just those physical cues that you can look at to say, all right, let's – I know data says let's not throw it at this guy in this situation, but he's huffing and puffing. My receiver likes it. Let's go after him. Yeah, yeah. All right, man. Last thing before we all get out of here. What are your expectations for the Seahawks over the back half of the season? And now that we have nine games of evidence to work with, are those expectations different than the ones you had before the season started? Nah, they're the same. Yeah. I I thought this is a team getting to the playoffs and win a game. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And and then you just got to get lucky after that. And that's I think that's something people don't realize, too, is teams have to get lucky to make a run. 
your personnel is going to help you. Your coaching is going to help you. But lucky means you get a call that goes your way. You're you're not as injured as the other team. And you get performances from guys that you didn't expect. You know, you have a, a rookie or a, a number three step up and play like a Boye Mafia. I didn't expect Boye to have seven sacks at this time of the year. Last year, he had a few sacks. I was expecting maybe five or six out of this dude right. at the end of the year. So, no, I think this is still the same team. I think that I've we've learned a little bit, but we're going to learn even more after next week when they hit that gauntlet. So, no, it ain't changed for me. It's just get into the playoffs, win a game, and see what happens because the Niners, I know they lost three in a row. They just bounced back. They're still going to be there. Dallas is so up and down, but you never know. Philly's still good. The dang Vikings are winning with a with a Shit, backup quarterback. Man. It's just there's the talent on this roster is there, but the development isn't there to where I'm confident in saying that these guys are true contenders. They're like number three, number four contenders that are in a UFC, and they're they're yeah, you know, they're on the main card. Yep. Yep, that's exactly how I feel too. And it's like, you know, the the thing that concerned me is I think Seattle's got all this crazy perimeter talent between their wide receivers, their corners, yeah. safeties. But last year, man, they just couldn't line up and be physical with other teams. And this year, it felt like they're a little bit closer. I still wouldn't consider them like a physical team the way that Pete Carroll right. wants them to be, but they're closer. And I can't help but feel, especially I feel like a little bit of a pass in the Ravens game with the addition of Leonard Williams, right? He, uh-huh. he got in like four days before that, played a few snaps. But like, he looked great in this game because yeah, he had the sack and that's like the one thing that goes on the stat sheet, but Seattle ain't really had guys lately that command double teams up front. You know, there's, there's no reason to bring extra blockers against Seattle's front four. And now there is, cause we saw it. We saw them have to do that because Leonard Williams. And to me, it's like, okay, do I still think they can stand in with the Eagles and trade punches? Can they stand in with the 49ers and trade punches? No, but they're not going to wilt now. And that was my big concern when I was looking at the stretch. So now my question to you, last question of the day is, you got to bet $10,000 of your own money right now on how many of the next five games they win. Rams, Niners, Cowboys, Eagles, Niners. You get the number exactly right. Double your money. How many they win? Now these next five. Woo. I'm going to say three. I think you get the Rams, you split with uh, San Fran, and then either Dallas or Philly are going to slip up somehow. Uh-huh. And, and it's probably going to be Dallas. I am. I feel like I'm Stephen A. Smith when it comes to Dallas. <laughs> I do not like Dallas. They come in with all this hype every single year. They're fans yeah. obnoxious. My wife, my wife is Mexican. So you know that the Latin community is big with the Cowboys, man. They love them, man. All the relatives. It's just a deep hate in me for the Cowboys and uh, they always find a way to disappoint. So I'm just going to count on them continuing <laughs> the tradition of 30 years of disappointment. Yeah, man. All right. I like it. Hey, that's that's more ambitious than me, man. If you offer me two and three right now, I'm taking it. That puts right. the that puts Seattle at eight and six heading into what's a pretty soft finish. I would take that. If they're nine and five, man, look the hell yeah. out because if they do what you're saying and they split with the 49ers, then – then it's just a race to the finish and the Niners ain't played Baltimore yet. So, you know, like yeah. they still, Here they still come. got the Eagles and the Cowboys and the Ravens. So it's not like it's smooth sailing for them either. Nah, man, this is uh, we're going to find out who these guys are real quick. Starting with the Rams, honestly, because I agree. Uh, they always, play I agree. Guys, uh, not overlooking them at all. There is no part of me that's like, oh, this is a three and six team. Like, put it in the bag. <laughs> nah, heck no. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bro. This has been super fun as it always is when you're here. Thank you again for coming in. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Finally, where can those listening get more of you? Oh, uh, man. Uh, on Twitter, Michael Bumpus5. I'll be there. Uh, during the week, I record Talking Cougars with my guy Alex Brink. It airs on Root on Wednesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. It's all random. Uh, they played a few times. Uh, Pat 12 Network uh, this Saturday, where I'm at. I'm in the studio this Saturday. I'll be with uh, Nigel Burton and uh, Kyle Draper. So uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, man. Uh, and then uh, obviously Monday through Friday with Stacy on the Bumpin' Stacey Show 10 to 2.
Yeah, we love it, man. I'm super appreciative of everything you do outside of coming on this show. There's a reason that we're always so excited to have you in. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. All right, friends, that's going to do it for today. As always, you can find Mike and I on social media as well. I am on Twitter at, at Jackson Bevins. That's J A C S O N. Remember that no K is okay when spelling my name. Mike is on Twitter at, at Mike Barwin, and the show itself is at Cigar Thoughts. You can catch full video episodes on our YouTube channel at Cigar Thoughts and find the rest of our socials at CigarThoughtsNFL.com. Of course, you can listen to this show and read every article at FieldGoals.com slash Cigar Thoughts. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and you like the show, drop us a five-star rating and leave a quick review. Finally, be sure to check out CigarThoughtsNFL.com to get your exclusive Cigar Thoughts cigars. Or hit me up on Twitter and I'll shoot you the deeds. And when you buy those cigars... Reach out and tell us what you think. Thank you to all of y'all listening for your continued support of the show. We know you've only got so much time for podcasts in your life, and it's an honor to be a part of that for y'all. Please know that by sharing the show on social media and with your friends, you give us the juice to keep making this happen. We'll be back soon, but in the meantime, onwards and upwards, my friends. Cigar Thoughts.